just really thankful to see this many parents in one place who just really care about their kids and, and doing the best thing for their kids. Um, I know that in the room we probably have a lot of different kinds of parents. We have parents that still have little kids. We have parents that have teenagers. We have people who serve in youth ministry. We may even, a lot of times, I don't see any. So if, you, if this fits you, then you look great. But I, a lot of times I get a lot of grandparents that are, that are raising, uh, raising teenagers and they're like, this is a whole new thing. I don't know what's going on. And so, um, so I'm, I'm just really excited to be here. And I want to tell you right out the gate that um, I have no idea what I'm doing parenting. <laughs> I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. So this is not something that we deal with yet in, in, our, um, in our house. We, um, you know, we fight about turning the TV off because we've been watching too much like Mickey Mouse, you know, we don't deal with um, technology to the, to the level that y'all do. Um, so the question is kind of how did you get here? If, um, if this is not something that you, that you live with every day, then, then why are you the person that is brought here to speak about this? So um, when I was in seminary, I did, um, I worked at the Youth Ministry Institute and um, I did a lot of research on technology and sexuality and the changing um, generation. And so I started going and traveling and speaking about the research that I was doing and when I graduated, it just kind of continued. And I tell everyone right out the gate um, that I'll tell you everything I know about technology, which is probably not a lot, and I'll tell you everything I know about child development, which again is probably not a whole lot, but um, at the end of the day, we know that as God's people, Scripture has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. That is Second Peter, um, chapter one says that that God's Spirit in us has given us all things that we need for life and godly living. And so, at the end of the day, that's really what I want for you guys to 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 walk away with is feeling emp empowered as parents to raise your kids in the light of of scripture. Um, just a little bit about me. I kind of told you how I got to where, why I'm in this room, but um, number one thing that, that is important about me, obviously, is that I'm a Christ follower um, and a mom, even though I'm just figuring it out and I have no idea what that looks like. Um, I've served in ministry for a long time now. Um, I did campus ministry for about 10 years. I don't know. I haven't done that math in a while. Um, it's about 10 years I was on different college campuses. Um, I served at, most recently, at the University of South Alabama, and when I was serving there, um, my husband and I started dating, and he lived in Gadsden. We had met previously in college. He lived in Gadsden. I lived in Mobile. Obviously, that is not sustainable, um, so um, when we got married, I moved <coughs> to Gadsden with him, where he works in the family business, and... Um, when I got to Gadsden, I was like, what am I going to do now? There's one um, community college, and it's not hopping. So um, so we do college ministry at our church, and we have a phenomenal group of students um, that we invest in. But um, I needed kind of a restart, and so I, I was just kind of looking at the things I was doing in life and... Um, the things I was passionate about, and so I went back to school and got my master's degree in um, social work. So I am about to venture into the field of um, therapy and counseling. So I do have a little experience there um, through seminary and um, social work in child development and, and those kind of things. Um, for anybody who's a nerd like me, I included my some personality test responses there because some of you like to know those things. Um, I'm a Ravenclaw. I like to um, study. I, my husband's like, you have two master's degrees. What are we going to pay for next? And who knows? Um, I'm an ESFJ. I like to be around people and um, I'm maybe not always the best decision maker. I'm an Enneagram 7. I'm an otter, which is funny because being a Ravenclaw, you would think I would be a lion, but I'm not. Yes, that's exactly an otter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody in this room is enjoying this. Some, I don't know who you are, but somebody, somebody right now is enjoying this. Um, yeah, you, 
probably not. Um, on the temperament test, I'm a guardian, which um, has changed since I became a parent. And then, um, if you haven't done the Clifton Strengths Finder, if you're into this thing and you haven't done Clifton Strengths Finder, you need to do it. Um, so my Clifton Strengths are woo and communication, which means I'll win you over and then talk you to death. So, um, so there you go. This is me, and here's and there's my family. These are the stages of human development. Um, it's pretty basic. Um, you start out as a baby, obviously, um, and as a baby, you learn: can I trust you, or who can I trust? What can I trust? The baby cries, someone responds to them. If you don't respond to them, then they don't trust you over um, a long period of time. This, is, this period lasts about two years. Um, toddlers, they begin to learn autonomy versus shame. They learn self-control. They learn willpower. This is why the twos are terrible twos. Um, and they start to ask and want to know if being them is acceptable. Now that sounds really crazy for a two to four year old to be thinking, but they're learning things like, is it okay to want this? Um, and it could be as simple as my four year old, um, I think it was Wednesday, I picked out an outfit for her to wear. She doesn't get to pick her own clothes, whole deal. Like some of you do that, it's great, works for you. We don't have time for that in my house. So I'm like, this is what you're wearing today. And the shirt did not fly, just didn't. Mm -mm. She was not wearing it, not having it. So then she got the shirt that she wanted. Well, of course, at that point, it doesn't match the pants. So I'm like, you can wear the pink shirt, but not with the pink pants because they're not the right kind of pink. So we have to go get new pants. Well, by the end of this whole debacle, she's laying in the floor screaming because her pants are touching her too much. And I'm like, baby, I get it. You know, I don't really like pants either. But, like, it's just kind of what we have to do. Like, we can't go to school with no pants on. And so she's, they're learning these kinds of things. Is it okay to have a preference on pants? Um, is it okay to, uh, to like chicken nuggets and not whatever fancy meal mom spent an hour and a half cooking? So is it, is it okay to have these personal preferences? And... Um, eventually, if they continue to be told, no, 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 it's not okay, your preference is not okay, what you want is not okay, then they will revert to shame because they have not been given any autonomy. Um, as they get preschool age, they learn initiative versus guilt. This is where kids learn how to try things, do things. It's okay to fail and try again. Um, my kid is also not very good at that. Um, the whole, like, if she builds a tower and it falls over before she's ready for it to fall over, it's like the end of the world. Like, we are in meltdown mode. Um, and with baby brother, that happens a lot. Um, school age, they learn, um, industry versus inferiority. Am I gonna make it? The questions at the bottom here, I think, are really powerful because it's really easy to talk in these big, you know, industry versus inferiority. Am I productive or am I inferior to everyone around me? But when you just look at just that question, can I make it in the world? That's your elementary school kid right there. Am I going to be okay? <laughs> um, can I make it? Then, now this is where we get into kind of our realm, right? Teenagers, they're understanding who they are versus being confused about who they are. The question there is, who am I and what can I be? Those are gonna be really important. We're gonna come back to those several times. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting here that we're gonna come back to. In young adulthood, you learn intimacy versus isolation. This is why it's so difficult for someone who's 30 years old to wrap their mind around being single. Because this is the identity crisis of the age. But the ultimate question that you're trying to answer as a young adult is, can I love others? How? How do I love others? And on the flip side of that, you're also learning, am I lovable? Um, but there's something really interesting here when you look at teenagers as they're trying to understand who am I and what can I be, they are jumping ahead in our current culture 
to intimacy and isolation versus isolation as the answer to the question, who am I and who can I be? So we have an entire generation of kids that because of media, in my opinion, and we will get there, this is a whole other spiel, but because of, of media and because of desensitization and saturation of culture, they're answering the question, who am I and what can I be, with a question, can I love, who can I love, am I lovable, that they're not developmentally ready to answer. So we're already seeing here a huge disparity that we're going to talk about. Um, and then later on, this is, this is some of you guys, does my life count, and then did my life count. So um, we're preparing kids to, to answer these questions. So if you'll go to the next slide, this is um, just a little picture of who your kid, y'all, I don't think y'all have this one because this is just a fun little talking point. Um, this is just kind of a picture of um, our students today. So I like this. It's fun to me. I just think they're really fun. Every year there's a list released that describes characteristics of kids that are going into kindergarten and what, they, what their life has been like until that point and how it is different from previous generations. So this is the class of 2023. So this is a lot of your students. It's, <laughs> these are just fun things about them. They view 9-11 the same as Pearl Harbor. What that means is they read about it in a history book and it was a thing that happened a long time ago. Um, they have always taken photos on a phone. Their whole entire life, you have been able to take a photo on your phone. I don't know about y'all, but when I first got a phone that had a camera on it, you couldn't tell who it was. You were like, I took a picture, and it was like a purple square. Um, nearly half of their generation is people of color. So that's African American, Latinx, um, whatever, immigrants. Um, their parents could have owned an Xbox when they were a baby. I think that one's kind of fun. Because I don't think I had an Xbox. Well, I, I never had an Xbox. But I don't think Xboxes were a thing until I was probably college. Um, PayPal has always been an option. <laughs> Only two-thirds of the generation that they are currently growing up in identify as exclusively heterosexual. There have always been smartwatches <laughs> their whole life. I remember thinking Apple was crazy and they would never sell one. <laughs> Monica and Chandler have always been married. <laughs> That's what, like season seven or something? <laughs> spoiler alert! <laughs> I don't think you have to give a spoiler alert. Sorry to ruin it for you, but you're like the only one. <laughs> the Amazing Race has always been on TV their whole life. Um, Coke and Pepsi have always had a sports drink, and uh, Cal Ripken Jr. has always been retired. So I just think these are fun. It's just kind of a, a picture of culture. So um, when you look at this generation of students, um, there are some defining factors about them. They are known as Gen Z. Um, and they have started to graduate high school and enter college and or the workforce. They were born between 1995 and 2015. Um, they are the most ethnically diverse group of any U.S. in, in all of U.S. history. Um, they are statistically less adventurous in person. That, that means they don't leave their house much. They don't do, um, you know, wild and crazy things like we did when we were kids. Anybody ever, like, flip your go-kart on purpose, you know? That's not, that's not this generation. <laughs> um, you may have a kid that's like that, but overall, that's not this, this generation. They are smartphone natives. That means they've, they've had one their whole life. My one-year-old... Um, he's obsessed with balls, 
and he will get my phone and these things that are circles, he thinks they're a ball. So he knows how to open the camera and then push that button a thousand times and say ball, 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 ball. So, um, so I get pictures of like the side of his head um, very regularly. Um, they perceive the world in what they consider to be snaps or bite-sized pieces. And not only do they perceive in bite-sized pieces, they're usually right. Um, we may come into a situation and it takes us a little while to sort of figure out what's going on. But they're very perceptive. But they see things in tiny, small pieces. Um, this is important when it comes to communicating with your kids. Um, they don't hear you if you talk for a long period of time. They just don't. Their world exists in 30-second clips. It also works in reverse. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> it's true of me and my husband, too. <laughs> um, they, uh, they have been conditioned to look at a photo on Instagram, look at a five-second clip on Snapchat, look at a reel um, of videos on, on Instagram, and tell you everything that's going on in the situation. They can look at a picture of their friend on Instagram and say, she's having a bad day. They can look at, and this one's big, this one is big, especially if you have a girl. They can look at a picture or a snap on Snapchat and see three people snapping the same place and understand within 10 to 15 seconds that they've been left out. What took me a whole weekend, right? Like, I didn't know till Monday, you know? Like, I showed up at school on Monday and everybody's talking about the movie they went to, and I'm like, oh, well, thanks for the invite, you know? They know in 15 seconds that they've been left out. Um, however, somehow, I don't know how, statistically, they're very optimistic. Um, they see the world as a place that they can conquer, that they can, uh, they can own. They, there's talk, and I don't know if any of this is true. I have no idea what's going on. My husband and his family, they own 10 McDonald's, and we cannot staff a single one of them completely staffed. So I don't know why people, why there's an employee shortage. I don't know, but there is speculation that when this generation who started graduating high school in 2019 is moving into the workforce, they're all going to work for themselves. <laughs> um, and I, I do see that. I see that a lot. You can sell whatever you want to on Facebook and make as much money <laughs> as somebody who's worked for 20 years in a career. Well, yes, <laughs> and sometimes not pay taxes. <laughs> um, so they are incredibly optimistic. They are also very, very lonely. The rates of um, teenagers who are in therapy being diagnosed with depression, anxiety, social disorders are sky high, higher than they have ever been. Um, so there's some really great things about this generation, and then there's some really sad things about this generation. Um, but they're ours, and we love them, and so how do we equip them? How do we, how do we move forward? Um, is it a video next? Uh, yeah, this oh, yeah, this, oh, I don't know how that didn't get formatted, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, just this is a little bit of kind of, I guess, like scientifically, where are they? Um, puberty hits most kids between 12 and 14. You might have the weird nine-year-old, 16-year-old who are still kind of going, going through that. Um, they have more changes in their life than at any other time other than birth. Um, boys are, because of the boost in testosterone. They are very overwhelmed with um, any kind of sexual thoughts, ideas, urges. Um, and girls, again, because of the surge in emotional hormones, um, become overwhelmed with comparison and word-seeking. So the number one thing 
going on in your teenage boy's world right now is how do I deal with sexual attraction? And the number one thing going on in your girls, teenage girls world right now is how do I compare to other people? Do I live up? Um, so uh, there's a video clip I'm going to show in just a second. There's a film out called Eighth Grade. And it's actually rated, I think, maybe PG-13. Because there's a, a couple of scenes in it that are just incredibly realistic about some of these issues. Um, but in general, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a bad film. Um, it, it follows the life of this girl that at school, she's just really socially awkward. Um, and she doesn't really have friends. It shows her kind of going down the hallway at school trying to speak to people, and they're just ignoring her. Um, and so she creates for herself this life on social media where she's a whole other person. Not a bad person, just a completely different person on social media because she's not accepted for who she is in person. Um, but I, I want you to just watch this clip and think about your teenagers, your house, your living room, your kitchen, your kid's bedroom, and, and put your kid in this situation and look at how information passes through her brain. going to bed. Okay. Okay. Good night. Night. Are you, are you, are you mad at me? No, I just, next time can you please knock? Yeah, sure, sorry. I mean, I did. Well, uh, do it louder or something, I don't know. For sure. Yep, got it. Sorry. Shit. Shit. 
So you guys seem like a pretty interactive bunch. What do you? Uh, what did you notice about this clip? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know what I just watched. <laughs> okay. It's like a sci-fi movie. <laughs> <laughs> it a lot of money to break the fix that screen. Yeah. Uh, yep. She's living through, she's living through the screen. She's living through everybody else's life. And the, the invite. Yeah. yeah the invite was that I want you to come. My mom told me I had to invite you. So this is me doing that. In other words, I don't really want you there, mm -hmm. but I got to invite you from here. Mm -hmm. The isolation that she has in her room is just mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. But yet she feels like she's connecting, mm -hmm. but she's all alone mm -hmm. in real life. Anybody happen to notice on her? Um, uh, YouTube channel. She had no views on any yeah. other none of her story. I think she had like one on, or, you know. But yeah. they have a little attitude better than I would have. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Staying at the door. Yeah. 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 No. It, 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 let me see what's on your phone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Still on the yeah. <laughs> 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 what do you mean? What do you mean not? Yeah. Let's see it right here. <laughs> you do learn throughout the whole film that he is a single dad raising a teenage daughter, and so he's like, he's lost. So, I mean, have any of you ever? Um, scrolled Facebook and Instagram to the point that it just kind of looks like just pictures passing one after the other. It's all important. Um, so she, so she lives in this world where she's just engrossed in the phone. There's a scene. I actually think it's the next, the very next scene where she comes out to eat breakfast. And she's sitting at the table with a bowl of cereal, and she's got her phone, and she's scrolling like this, and she's just eating. And he's standing right there. And again, I'm like, you, like, no, that wouldn't fly at my house. But he's standing right there, and she's just staring at the phone, and he's like, so, what are you going to do today? And she's just not responding to him at all. Just, he's just talking, and she's just not looking in his direction. Um, and I don't, I don't think her having watched the whole thing, I don't think her intent is to be a jerk to her dad. Um, you don't, their relationship is not strained. Um, her intent is to fit in, is to figure out who she is, is to try to connect with somebody, anybody, anybody who might understand her, who might get her, who might know what's, what's going on in her life. Um, so let's talk a little bit about social media. I think you have a spot on your um, paper that's going to go with these next couple of, of slides. But since we're kind of in a talking, you can skip to the one that says um, parents' concerns. I think it's about four down maybe. Yeah, thank you. Um, tell me in, in your opinion, these are just things I've heard. <laughs> through the years. So I've, I've heard parents tell me these are the things they're concerned about. What are your kids watching? Is it inappropriate? Concerns about um, are my kids bullying others or being bullied on social media? Concerned about the amount of time they spend on their phone or whatever their chosen technology is. Um, concerned about their self-esteem comparing themselves to others. And a lot, a lot of parents are concerned about location sharing. Um, what other, what, what things did we miss there? I get concerned about predator. Oh, see, that's at the bottom. Predator. That's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Who's watching them? Mm -hmm. The thing that scares me the most is that they are now social engineering platforms to prey on our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's even in video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anything else? 
So, according to research, um, these are the actual issues that we're seeing with this, this current generation and the amount of time that they spend on their phone. Um, lots of them are dealing with depression. Um, I think that comes from a lot of different things. I think that comes from comparing themselves to others. I think it comes from not knowing how to have real life connections with people. I think it comes from being isolated in a dark room. I think it comes from not sleeping, which is the next thing. Sleep deprivation. I think that there are parents probably sitting in this room who would be shocked to know what time your kids go to bed. I guarantee you, if your child sleeps with a cell phone in their bedroom, they are not going to bed when you think they are going to bed. They're doing exactly what the girl in the video did. She said, night dad, she went to bed, and she laid there for hours and scrolled on the phone to the point that it just all looked like one big blur. Sleep deprivation. Um, addiction. They're becoming addicted to technology at such an early age that their brain is being preconditioned to become addicted to other things. They're academically, um, as a generation, based on the research, again, I'm not talking about your kids. I'm sure there's a kid in this room who made a 35 on the ACT when they were 14. I know some of you, and that will never be me, or probably my kids either, but by and large, this generation performs less um, academically. College acceptance scores are going down. <laughs> um, now, granted, some of your kids may have a 4.5 GPA because the school system has adapted to the academics. Um, but colleges are seeing the effects of this. They're seeing kids that can't write a research paper because they've never written a whole sentence. They can't spell because spell check does it for them. Anybody a teacher? Uh, if you teach high school, I, I mean, if you teach if you teach elementary school, you can see this. <laughs> they can't spell. I mean, and you're seeing it at you're seeing it starting at really really early ages. I had a friend tell me that I need to get my four year old a mouse so that she could learn how to use an old school computer. Um, before she starts kindergarten. And I was like, no. She doesn't play on the computer. She doesn't play on a tablet. She's not gonna, she's gonna go to kindergarten not knowing how to use a computer or a tablet. They said, well, she's gonna be behind. I said, I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't, you can teach her how to click the little app on the tablet. I don't have a problem with technology being used in education. I don't, I, let me say this from the get-go. All technology is not created equal. There is a place that it is important. It is valuable. <laughs> How many times do you get sermon tips, notes, study notes, look up a Greek word, a Hebrew word on the internet, right? All media, all technology, all um, social media even is not created equally. Um, but we're not going to do that in my house. They can learn that at school. Um, if you, so, so there's major, major academic effects that our teachers are having to overcome regularly. And part of it starts when they're in kindergarten and they can't talk to each other and they can't play. They don't have an imagination. You put them out on the playground and they're like, what do we do? Um, and then it goes all the way up to high school when they can't write sentences. They can't spell. They can't, they have no grammar. They have, because they've talked in little snippets their whole life. Um, and their social skills are highly, highly diminished. Um, I've spent a good part of my life as uh, serving as a secretary in lots of different um, places. And when I moved into a ministry role where I am now, I had previously been the um, one of the secretaries there. And so I moved into a ministry role, and we started looking to replace someone as a receptionist. Y'all, 
we cannot find somebody who has the people skills to say, have a seat, someone will be with you in a minute. Because they don't know how to talk to people. They have no, no social skills. <laughs> um, because they don't have to. And I know, and again, John can tell you, I'm chief of sinners here, but we don't have to talk on the phone because I can just answer you through a text message. And for, for me, it's quicker because I'm doing 87 things. I just graduated in December. I was, pr pr prior to December, was a full-time student, worked a full-time job, and raising two babies. I have a husband who works 60 to 70 hours a week. I teach three different Bible studies at my church. I run a ministry out of my house for college students. So I'm very, very busy. So if you want to get a hold of me, send me a text and I'll respond to you. If you call me, I don't have time. <laughs> there's a kid screaming. There's something going on in my office. There's a meeting I'm sitting in. There's a, you know, whatever. But I can text you back real quick even when all that stuff's going on. Because I'm a millennial. And I may not be a smartphone native, but I'm on the edge, right? Um, I did not get my first smartphone until college. I love to tell this story. I, my very first date that I went on, I was in, I think, eighth grade, um, which, which is not a date. I, don't, I think if your mom has to take you, it's not a date. But um, the movie theater across the parking lot from the movie theater was a crystal. And that was like, that's what we did in my little town. You went to the movies, and then as soon as the movie was out, you walked across the parking lot to Crystal, and you ate the nastiest fries of your whole life, and your mom picked you up from Crystal. And um, that was like the big Friday night, you know. So I had AOL Instant Messenger on dial-up. <laughs> and me and my little boyfriend, who we didn't talk to each other in person because we're middle schoolers and it's awkward, you know. So we'd just look at each other at school and then we would get home. And after everybody, you couldn't get on the internet till like 8 o'clock at night because if daddy gets a work call, you know, it's the whole deal. So, so you had to run the line, the phone line, down the hall from the living room and plug in the computer wait 45 minutes for it to connect to the internet and then you can talk to somebody for like you know six minutes before mom and daddy are shutting that down so so we had a do what exactly so uh and, and there's a key difference there because all of your quote unquote at the time as it was social media was in a shared space you weren't in your bedroom because you didn't have but one computer in the house and it had to be attached to the wall somewhere. <laughs> um, so, so we get on the AOL on like Friday after school and we're discussing our plans for the night, you know. And so our parents are going to drop us off and we were going to go see the brand new movie Spy Kids. And that was a big deal. And so uh, my dad said, well, I don't really want to drop you off at the door and just not know you're taken care of. I know he's a good kid. He's going to pay for you, but here's $10 just in case. And I'm thankful that he did that. Because what happened was we got to the movies. He got there 10 minutes before me. He waited, he waited, he waited. He assumed I wasn't going to show up. So he bought his ticket and went on into the movies because his mama dropped him off too. We didn't have a way home. His mama dropped him off. So he goes into the movie. Well, I get there can't find him anywhere. Well, my mom and daddy left. So I'm like, what do I do now? So I bought my ticket and I went in and I sat down. And after the movie, we go back out to the lobby and there he was. And that was my first date. We didn't even know the other one was there. Um, that, would, that would never happen today because uh, you can find anybody. You can find anybody you want at the drop of a hat. Um, and, and we're so connected that, um, that you don't... Anyway, that wouldn't happen today. So um, that, there you go. There's my fun story for the day. 75% of all teenagers are on social media. Now, what, that seems low, is that what you said? It probably is. Um, because kids lie to their parents about it. <laughs> so it probably is low. 
and they lie on social media about what their age is. So there's probably no way to get that real number. Um, but 75% of kids are on, or teenagers are on social media. Now, that is what we see. There are, um, what, what's interesting is how many accounts does your teenager have on their social media? Do you know how to check how many Instagram accounts they have? Do you know how to check if they have multiple Snapchat accounts? Do you follow them on all their accounts? <coughs> Do you follow all their friends on all their accounts? Um, so we'll, we will go further into that. Um, a majority of parents say that when raising their parent, when, when raising their parents, when raising their um, kids, their top two goals are character development and happiness. You want your kid to be happy and you want your kid to be a good person. However, those same parents, you can go to, yeah, to the next one, of those same parents, 13% say, only 13% say that technology has added joy to their life. And only 9% say that it makes them a better parent. So, so much of our life, so much of our budget, so much of our Christmas money, so much of our time is spent making sure our kids keep up with technology. Think about that question. How much of your money is spent making sure that your kid doesn't feel left out when it comes to technology? How many of you bought your, you don't have to answer this out loud or raise your hand, but how many of you bought your kid a phone well before you wanted to because you didn't want them to feel left out? Amanda did. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't set up group rules before we started. <laughs> <laughs> of those same parents, 42% say that technology has caused them as a parent to waste time. And 40% of parents say that their own technology use causes them to be more distracted. So if your number one goal for your kids is character development, which we as believers would hope that it would be discipleship, but the worldly answer to that would be character development. Um, but if your number one goal is to make them a good person, but us being believers in this room, let's say our number one goal is to make them like Jesus. It's to make them love, it's that they would love the Lord their God. Love with the Lord with all their heart. Exactly. That is our number one. That's it. Parents, yeah. That's it. That is the number one goal as parents. But yet, technology adds no joy to our life and wastes our time and causes us to be distracted. So if we as parents are sitting here in this conundrum, look at the lives that we're allowing our teenagers to live. And I'm just as bad as the next one. So, there's a book that um, Tony uh, Ranke wrote that is called 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. It's a really good book. Um, if you like to read, you can add it to your list. Um, but he goes through 12 different things that um, your phone has caused you to, I guess, act differently because of. Um, number one, we are addicted to distraction. We are so used to the second things get quiet, pulling our phone out. And not only do we pull our phone out, we're not watching 30 minutes worth of something. We're looking at stuff real quick. Um, 
if, if you click on a recipe, anybody do this, you click on a recipe and it's got like their life story before it gets to the recipe, I'm just like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to know that Mama bought this brand of butter and you buy this kind, but you, you, I don't want to know that. Tell me how to cook what that picture was. <laughs> you know? I saw that and it looked good and I don't need to know all that other stuff, right? <laughs> exactly. And if there's 12 ads between the title and the recipe, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not reading. I'll, I'll, yeah, I don't, probably would never cook anyway, right? I don't have the groceries for that. I'll just pick something different, you know? Um, we ignore flesh and blood. You ever look around a restaurant? How many families, families, do you see where the entire family is staring at a device and not talking to each other? <laughs> you would hope they would at least be talking to each other. I'll pretend that from now on. I mean, but, but the second you walk into a restaurant, starting at age two, you hand your kid a tablet because it's just easier. So when you're waiting for the waiter to come, the waitress to come, they're watching, you know, Daniel Tiger or whatever, and they don't even look up when the waiter comes, which why do why are we surprised when they have no social skills? If your six-year-old can't say to the waitress, could I have a Coke, please, or whatever, I don't, my kid would probably be like, 18 before I allow her to have caffeine because she's wild as it is. But, you know, if they can't order their own drink at the restaurant, how do you expect them to function in the real world? <coughs> no wonder when my teachers in the room ask their students a question, they don't answer it. Because they don't know how to answer. They don't know how to talk. They're addicted to distraction. And some of it is our fault. They ignore flesh and blood. Just straight up ignore it. Just like the girl in the video. Just straight up ignores the fact that, and, and I think it's funny that she acts so guilty, you know, and she's just, and her little crush, he's got like, I mean, his arms are little jelly arms, you know, and she's like, ooh, and then her dad walks in and she's so embarrassed. I love it. I love middle schoolers. But somebody needs to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I will love her. I don't know that I will love all middle schoolers. I will love my kids when they are in middle school. <laughs> they say how they act when they're four is exactly how they act when they're 14. I don't know if that's true, but y'all need <laughs> in 10 years, y'all going to be visiting me in a padded room. I'm just saying. Um, okay, uh, we crave immediate approval. This is a true story that just happened to me on the way down here. On the way down here. I am taking my social work licensure exam on Monday, and a friend sent me this video that was like, all the changes you need to know in the licensure exam, the master's level licensure exam for 2022. And so I'm watching this video, and the guy goes, here is the biggest change, the biggest change in the licensure exam from 2021 to 2022. You no longer, when you answer your last question, get an immediate pop-up on the screen that says pass or fail. You now have to gather your belongings, walk to the front desk, and wait for a printout. And y'all, I panicked. Because I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to take me five minutes to get that printout. And I'm not going to know. And yes, that's an extreme situation, but we crave immediate approval. We want to know what we want to know right then. And going back to that very first worksheet I gave you, What's the question that they're asking? Somebody tell me. What is the question our teenagers are asking? The very bottom. Who am I and am I loved? So they throw a picture up there. They throw out a piece of their personality. They throw out something about themselves that they want to know. Is it okay? 
Is this who I am? Is this who I want to be? Am I accepted? How do I measure up? And so they want that immediate approval. They want to know right then, am I enough? Who am I? And if they put something out there and it gets a whole lot of likes, and then the next day they put something else out there and it gets no likes, guess who they're going to be? <laughs> so the next question I'm going to ask, what kind of content do you think gets the most likes? Is it the Bible verses? Uh-uh. Is it the come join us Wednesday night at church? Uh-uh. Although John probably works really hard to put some good graphics out there on social media that his kids will share. It's not getting the most likes. Is it the, um, uh, is it the, the, a little snippet where they shared about how great D Now Weekend was or how great Youth Camp was? No. It's the pictures of girls with shirts that don't cover enough. It's the pictures of um, all these things that we know don't define us. It's appearance. It's, it's who we're with. It's what activities we're doing. And those things don't define us. But our teenagers haven't learned that yet. Because <coughs> teenagers. Um, we lose our literacy. We can't read. Right? We already had that conversation. Um, we feed on things that are produced. This is kind of a big deal because a lot of times church, discipleship, Bible study family devotion, those things are not flashy. So when they're only valuing things that look pretty on the outside, it changes the way they view other things. Why do you think it's so important that your youth group look, room looks this awesome? Because they're looking on social media and they're comparing it to other youth rooms. They don't really care, at the end of the day, where they're going to grow the most in Christ. They want to know where is everybody else and what looks cool. Um, and they become, or we, we all do, we become like what we like. The things that you spend time looking at on the internet is who you act like. The YouTube channels that your kids watch is who they're acting like. And I can attest to that. Because my precious little four-year-old and her sassy self watches this really, really annoying YouTube channel. And if you have kids, little kids around you, um, that and I don't let her watch it on my phone or tablet because anything we watch on TV, everybody has to watch. So she watches this really, really annoying thing where it's like a girl, like a little child, like she's six or seven, and she's playing with these Anna and Elsa dolls. And it makes me just want to scream because I'm like, just put, turn the TV off and go play with your own doll. Like, you have that exact same doll. But when she does go play with her little dolls, she sounds just like it. And if you give her something new, y'all, she will narrate it and then tell you, like and comment. Like, nobody's commenting on anything, darling. You're sitting at the kitchen table. You know, like, so, I mean... It is like, and she's just four. So we become like what we like. We get lonely. Um, we get really comfortable with secrets. We get really, really comfortable with secrets. Did you know that the average study says that 50% of evangelical pastors are addicted to pornography? Why? because we are incredibly comfortable with secrets. We lose meaning. Things just don't mean as much. We fear missing out. Right? Like I said, I was, it was like Monday before I figured out I had missed anything. But now they know immediately. We become harsh to one another. 
we say things on the internet that we would never say in real life until you've said it so many times on the internet that you start to say it in real life. And then you're like looking at your kid like, where did you even, I've never heard you talk like that before. Well, have you read all their comments on everything on social media? Because maybe they talk like that all the time. We lose our place in time. We just have no clue what time it is. No idea. Time just passes by. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about, this is like what you came here for and what we're going to spend the least amount of time on. Sorry, but you're stuck now. I told you I would win you over and then talk you to death. So, um, understanding the media. There are different kinds of apps that I just want to give a few examples of. Social media. This is your basic see pictures, talk to one another, that kind of thing. Um, I have no idea what Marco Polo is. Whenever I added it, maybe it was going to be popular. I don't know. Do you? I wonder when I added that and why I. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, so these are your basic kind of. So it's probably more of a messaging app than a social media. Okay. It's a walkie talkie. Yeah, yeah, it's a messaging app. Sorry. See? Y'all taught me something today. Um, social media. This is sharing things about your life um, that, you know, whatever. You know what social media is. Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, all those things. Meeting and date up, da mm -hmm. dating and meet up apps. Um, a lot of your teenagers uh, are not on these, but if they are, there's something bigger going on here. For the most part, Teenagers hook up with kids they go to school with. Homeschooled. <laughs> if they're homeschooled, I don't know who they hook up with. Um, but it's been that way, you know, from the history of school, right? That's what teenagers do. But um, there are some exceptions to that, and this is a whole other spiel that we'll get to in a minute. But um, sometimes if your teenager is trying to figure out their sexual identity, they will turn to these things because they're looking for someone to help them define themselves with no commitment and no one else knowing it. So the teenagers that are more susceptible to having an issue with a meeting, dating app, meetup app, are your teenagers who are dealing with sexual identity or gender identity. Um, messaging apps, we just talked about, that's Marco Polo, that's how you talk to each other. Again, um, these are not, well, we'll, we can talk about that in a second, but these are just alternatives to texting. Um, and then anonymous posting apps, these are pretty popular. These are just things that you can randomly post without anybody knowing who posted it. Except that. Well, yes. <laughs> 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 nothing truly anonymous on the internet. That is true. And nothing ever goes away. Um, they're the, yeah, that's them. Whisper, Meet Me, Yik Yak. Uh, Whisper's probably the, Whisper's probably one of the biggest ones. <laughs> um, these, I will say, I will tell you, these a lot of times, the kids that are susceptible to issues with these kind of apps are typically um, kids who are depressed, suicidal, um, or de again, dealing with gender or sexual identity. Because these are places you would tell your secrets. You want to go on an app like Whisper and say... Um, no one knows, but I just hooked up with a kid in the bathroom at school. Like, that's what you're, that's the kinds of things they would be posting. Um, secretive stuff. So, um, tell me, um, y'all can kind of discuss this. What do you think the pros and pros, let's start with pros of social media. <coughs> what are the positive things? You all have it. No. <laughs> I mean, it's a good way to get news out. 
Okay. You know, if something bad has happened, mm -hmm. you can spread the word real quick. Other than that, it's useless. <laughs> you, you, you can stay in touch with a distant family. Okay. But I keep up with friends all across the country. Yeah. Okay. For church, it's good because you can, you know. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. During the pandemic, we, I mean, a lot of us watched church on YouTube or Facebook. But I think the con to that is you assume everybody's on Facebook. Everybody's getting your message that you get out or, that, you know, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have our neighborhood. It drives me nuts that people post things in our neighborhood. Everybody in our neighborhood ain't on Facebook. So why do you think? I hate the neighborhood Facebook group. It. It's like, has anybody seen my mail? <laughs> Whose dog's out? It's the same 20 people who live in this neighborhood Amen. for the last 20 years. You know <laughs> whose dog that is. <laughs> it's, the same it's mine. He's always out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're getting letters. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. I hate it. But I did find my, I, did, I have an inside dog and an outside dog. My outside dog can jump the eight foot privacy fence. So she stays out. She's always out. The Facebook post is always about my dog. Always. It's always my dog. It's fun to track them though. Like, you know, oh, they're over at Penny's house. Now dog's in Jan's pool. Yeah. Yeah. Always. The, the neighborhood kids will come to the yard and yell the dog's name until she jumps over the fence. Oh. Like, so anyway, well, so cons. We assume that we assume our information's getting out. We assume. I think that does create isolation for people who, and and we have to think about our teenagers in these things. They do get isolated. They do get left out if they don't have social media. They do, um, because they didn't see the post that went out. What else? What are your what cons do you see? The widespread misinformation. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. That's a big one lately. <laughs> Especially on a college campus. Uh, yes. Well, it's also just really the comparison game mm -hmm. is big because you only get a picture your best self on social media. Sure. Yeah. And these filters on the, um, really the Instagram filters are like you can change your eye color, your hair color, your, it like that quick. What is happening? Um, meeting and date up apps. We, I cannot say that correctly today. Um, meet up and dating apps. We talked about that. Um, they, I think in some very limited, I say this so carefully, but some very limited scenarios when you're like an adult and can make wise decisions maybe there's some pros there I say again I say that very carefully but the cons um, it's really easy to um, for people to pretend that they're someone they're not the interaction is not personal and you can be anybody you want to be um, and this is where a lot of your criminal activity is going to kick in this is where a lot of the hey send me a picture is going to happen um, and this and messaging apps this is where the I'm gonna send my boyfriend a picture um, that I shouldn't be sending him because I am comparing myself to other girls and his last girlfriend sent him a picture that she shouldn't have sent him. And so I have to live up and he is driven 100% by um, sexuality at this phase in his life. And he says that if I don't send him a picture, He's going to break up with me. But the little winter formal is next weekend, and if he breaks up with me, who am I going to go with? So I'm going to send him this picture, and nobody will ever know. And then the next thing, you know, the whole school has the picture. So there's your messaging apps. Um, some issues with messaging apps, and this is true of Facebook, this is true of Instagram, and this is true of lots of apps that are created simply for messaging. Um, this, uh, the, one of the major issues here is that they go away very quickly in their, in their minds. So here's the dangers of social media and messaging apps. Your teenage girls have been asked to send naked pictures of themselves. Bottom line. 
And if they do it, they're popular. They're in the it crowd. But the little boys will promise them, I'm not going to show it to anybody else. It's just mine. And then the next thing you know, the whole school will sing it. So this is serious stuff. The creator of Snapchat, when he first created it, was asked, what did you make this platform for? He said, so that we can send pictures we don't want anybody else to see and they can go away quickly. He had the intention from the very beginning. Yeah. I just want to say, most of y'all know I'm, I'm a police officer. In this area, if your daughter sends a picture, she's getting charged too. Right. So y'all need to know that. If they get them all. <coughs> There was a video that went around on Facebook, it's been a little while, probably a year or two ago, where the girl had been charged for distribution of child pornography, and uh, it was a picture of herself, and she was sharing about it. I think it had happened maybe when she was like 16, but now she was an adult, and she was sharing about it, whatever it was. The video went around, and she said in the video, the reason that she sent the picture was because she could not enjoy a date with her boyfriend until they got the sexual stuff out of the way because all he did the whole time they were on a date was hound her. Just the whole time they were out. If you would just do this, if you would just send me that, if you would just do that to me or this with me, then we could go and do whatever you want. And so she sent him the picture before they went on the date so that maybe she could get it out of the way and they could have a good time. So here's the difference. When we were 16, when you were 16, you didn't have the internet to do these things for you. you it was really difficult to, uh, to access pornography. And if you did access pornography, it was vastly different. It was like your mama's Victoria's Secret magazine that you cut a picture out of the back of it and it didn't move and didn't interact. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if you wanted a video, you had to physically walk into a store and get it. Even when I was in college and we had computers, like that junk would shut your whole computer down. <laughs> like be gone in a second because of the, the viruses and all that like you just it was a lot harder to get it now it's one internet search and they've got anything they want to and they're comparing each other to those videos and if you wanted a picture of your girlfriend or if you wanted to be the boy who sent the picture you thought you were all cool and send it out to everybody you got to go to Walmart and get that joker printed. <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing that? Right? So this is... I used to work at Harco and they had the... Yeah. I didn't work in that department, but you could tell when they got a roll. <laughs> I'm sure you could. <laughs> D9. Yeah, exactly. And then when you go to pick it up, it wouldn't be there. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't that's not the case anymore you send it and it is all over the town right so we go to the next one um here's some dangerous things that kids say i don't think this is on there i'm sorry uh dangerous things that kids say on social media nobody gets me <coughs> if you're um uh, these are statements that predatory people look for in our kids. Nobody gets me. As soon as a predator thinks that your child feels misunderstood, they're going to make your child feel understood. Because when your child connects to them, then they now have access to your child. I'm so sick of being single. Well, I can fix that. I'm so ugly. Well, I'm going to send you messages telling you how beautiful you are. Now, 
this is a true story too. Teenager that I know well. Um, beautiful, beautiful girl. Just so happens to be incredibly tall. Never could get a boyfriend because she's taller than all the boys. So she posts pictures of herself on social media and she's gorgeous. Nothing provocative, just pictures of herself. Um, she's wanting the likes. She wants to feel accepted. She wants to feel... Her mother was a model. She looks just like her mother. She's absolutely gorgeous. She just posts innocent pictures of herself, waiting for people to like them because people don't like her in person because she's very tall. And um, she gets drawn in by this guy on the internet who ended up being a grown man who lived two states over had her convinced that he was a teenage boy in the next town and they were going to meet up and um, and hang out and she confided in her sister about it and her sister went and told their parents had the sister not stepped up what would have happened and this was a good kid these are church kids she didn't do anything wrong she did nothing wrong if you don't tell your kids that they're perfect, not perfect, beautiful, wonderful creations of God that God made in his image, and you don't surround them with other people who are constantly pouring into them that they are the image of God, then somebody is going to tell them who they need to be. Um, posting pictures that say, how do I look? Oh, that's annoying too. People do that on Instagram all the time. Um, our teenagers do. Um, kids make the statements, my parents don't trust me. I need to get out of here. I'm being treated like a kid. These are all red flags to say, um, I will let you be somebody different. Tony Ranke says, smartphones do not invent new sins. They simply amplify the temptations We've dealt with all this before, but it amplifies the things that are already there. And I think... Uh, One thing I said, like, in parenting classes, like, you know, we always talk about the sin out there, but, like, we really have to help them deal with the sin in here because that's always going to be there, but it's how do you deal with this temptation and, can, and like, how do you um, step into Christ to yeah. overcome that? And so I think that's true. Like, we got to help them deal with their mm -hmm. own hearts because... We can't fix that. Yeah. I think, too, we have to um, realize that it's not a them issue. It's a us issue. It's a, it's a everybody issue, right? Our kids don't have problems. Our kids don't sin. We all have problems. We all sin. Mama and Daddy have to own up to their, to their sins before we can help our kids deal with their own sins.